To lead off our program tonight is Mr. David Paler, whose just presentation you have just seen. Mr. Paler is the coordinator of junior high health, physical education, and athletics for the St. Paul schools. So it's my pleasure to present Mr. Paler. Thank you. It's very nice to see a large group of people who are interested in a health problem. One of the things that uh, I try to do uh, is tell you a little bit about myself so that you'll know who's talking, so that you can believe what you want to believe. One of the things that uh, I have done over the last oh, six, seven years is do a great deal of talking. Uh, about three years ago, I started out with the St. Paul schools, and I helped them to develop and helped our community to accept a family life and sex education program. And I did a lot of speaking, like four out of every five nights. I go home, my wife would uh, put the supper in front of me, and she'd say, where are you going tonight? And I'd tell her, and she said, what's your topic again, family, what? And... Uh, I tried to explain to her I was helping other people, and she says, well, start helping here at home. One of the things that I did as a teacher eight years ago, my kids asked me uh, a lot of questions about drugs. I didn't know any of the answers. We had a health textbook that said marijuana was physically addicting. I knew that wasn't true, but I, I wasn't sure why it wasn't true. I went down to the St. Paul Police Department and asked uh, if I could talk with somebody in the Narcotics Division. The answer that I got was, we don't have a Narcotics Division. I said, really? So I came over here to Minneapolis. I went and asked uh, a local sergeant, I guess it was, and he said, oh, another dumb teacher. I says, uh, okay, but can I get some help? He sent me to another person, and I, first thing I says, well, I'm a teacher, in the same, another dumb teacher, he says. I says, yeah, I'm a dumb teacher, but how am I supposed to get smart if you don't tell me nothing? So finally, he sent me up to an individual who talked to me a little while, and in his conversation, he called me a dumb teacher, and I got a little upset. He finally realized that I was sincere. I sat with him a couple of hours. He happened to get a telephone call from an individual who was on drugs, who he knew pretty well. This fellow came in, and they talked for a while. He said, you really want to learn, don't you? And I said, yeah. I got a special permit. I got some of those fantastic training that uh, a lot of people will never get. I just was excused from my own school system approximately two weeks ago, and I went to the University of Chicago who sent me to the local AMA in Nebraska. I was taken to a clinic. 3.30 in the morning, I reported into this clinic as a patient. They didn't know that I was coming. And I was to go through what an addict would go through without any of the staff realizing that I was not an addict. I already had a case presented to them as I was a referral. I had another great experience. I have an office at Ramsey Junior High School in St. Paul, which is two blocks from McAllister College. My brother's a freshman there. I have a lot of juniors, seniors who come and talk to me about drugs. I have a lot of young people at the junior high school level who have come from, to, from my own school, from many other schools throughout the city. I have a special permit that I've had these many years to buy drugs. I get money to buy these drugs and take them into the laboratory. These drugs I have analyzed so that people can tell, these people can tell what's on the streets. What are young people getting? I guess it's about three weeks ago since I made my last buy, and don't ask me why I can buy it. Uh, I try to look straight. This is the way I feel best. And as I talk to young people, you see one of my jobs is to go into the classrooms, to talk and rap with young people. You see, I'm willing to talk, and I'm also willing to listen. Three weeks ago, I made a buy. I took it into the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to their laboratory. They did the analysis. I had bought some marijuana, some Acapulco gold was what I was told. This is a pretty good brand of grass. I had it analyzed and it was less than 1% THC. It was one half horse manure. It had a large percentage of strychnine. 
And the other two pills that I had were, shall we say, not what they were supposed to be. The grass had been soaked in DMT. So what I paid money for, I didn't get. And this is one of the things that you learn, I guess, in the drug area. It's one of the dangers. I, for instance, happen to be a tennis professional during the summer months. I is a fellow out there who's brilliant. I couldn't match wits with him, and I don't think anybody in this room can either. But yet he's very stupid because he's a heroin addict. He cleaned the satellite that was out there. We became very good friends. I didn't know why he sought my company. To finally I realized he was a heroin addict. This young man who's about 26 years old, finally he's on the methadone program. I finally got through to some judges and people and said, why does he have to be an addict now to get on this program? One day, about four months ago, he called and asked me to come to his place. I went into his place, knocked at his apartment door. He says, you know it's open. I walked into his room, and he was laying on the couch, and he had a needle in this arm, and he had a needle in this arm. About six hours later, I says, hey, man, what you got in you? He says, I got coke in this arm, and he says, I got H in this arm. And he says, I'm going to lay here a couple of days and just groove. And we talked about a lot of things, and he wanted help desperately. About a week ago, a young married couple, about 22 years old, they've been married a year. They're my friends. They trip out on acid quite regularly. He called up and says, look, man, we're on bummers. We need help. No, I hope no speaker ever comes up before you and says every time you take some type of hallucinogen or any type of a drug that you have a bummer. Probably for every bummer that you hear about, there's probably 50 good trips. But these two young people were on bummers, and they called for help. I went into their place. When I got there, this young lady happens to have had the flu at exactly the same time. As I began to talk her down and talk him down, and I get them all quiet, she'd start to regurgitate. She thought she had devils and demons coming up out of her body. She thought her insides were coming out to stay on the outside. Each time I'd try to quiet her down, he'd think that I was physically harming her, and he'd jump up and start beating on me. About 3.30 in the morning, I got back to my own home. Last night, I was at Lakeland Elementary PTA. There's a young man from Stillwater who's working with a crisis intervention. And he began to talk about how he talks people down, about having a young lady take an orange and look at its beautiful color and to peel it and to take it and to eat it. And people in the audience began to laugh. And you know, unless you really understand what it is, unless you've got a fire in your hip pocket, unless you get involved, nothing's going to happen. I'm supposed to talk to you about curriculum tonight. You saw something that can go into curriculum, materials. I would say 90% of the films and film strips that I see are very bad. This one I think is good. But yet, the materials that you use are no good unless you, the person teaching this, have the proper attitude. I kind of enjoyed Bruce's introduction. I told you I've been speaking for many moons. I have a book at home that just introductions, because I have some pretty good introductions. Usually I'm called an expert. Now, it was kind of hard a couple of years ago when I was called a sex expert. Now, I will agree to you that I am an expert if you will go along with my definition of what an expert is. An ex, you know, is a has-been, and a spurt is a drip under pressure. Now, about three years ago, I was called by the Pennsylvania Health Department I've worked a great deal on venereal disease. They asked if I'd come talk. I said, look, I've been talking a lot, uh, and they convinced me finally I should come. I said, I won't get there till late because I've been doing a lot, and my wife says that maybe I should stick around a little bit and get to know my sons. So I was supposed to speak at 1.30. I got in on the plane and got to his particular place about 12.30. I asked where I was supposed to speak. It was an auditorium. I came in and I set up my materials and everything else, and I went and sat down about where this young man is here. It got to be almost 1.30. The whole place was filled. I thought there was going to be a movie or Bonanza or something was coming on. This guy comes rushing in. He says, are you Paler? And I says, uh-huh. He says, good. And he rushes up and he starts to introduce me. And Bruce, before 
we got started, he says, what should I say about you? And I says, as little as possible. And so he did say as little as possible. But this young man got up and he's the communicable health disease officer. And he says, doctors, nurses, ladies and gentlemen, da 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 da. And he went on for 20 minutes. 20 minutes he introduced me. He introduced me and introduced me. Later on that afternoon, I says, how come I got such a big introduction? He says, well, I wasn't too sure how much you had to say, so I wanted to give you as little time as possible. The 20 minutes had just about gone by, and he looked down at me, and I was a little impatient. I was wondering, what's going on here? And finally, he says, doctors, nurses, ladies and gentlemen, teachers, I'd now like to introduce you to the fellow who's responsible for all the venereal disease in the state. <laughs> so I'm used to uh, quite a few introductions. I think that one of the aspects that I'd like to admit to you right off the bat is that I do not believe the students and the young people that you will be involved with, some of you are student teachers, some of you soon will be, that the people that you talk to about chemicals, they do not know as much as you know. I would sit here and be the first one to admit that there are people who know a lot more than I know. But the majority of young people that I run into do not know and are asking to know. One of the biggest reasons for experimentation is because they don't know and they're afraid to ask. Their ego says, I'm supposed to know that, but I don't want to show anybody else how dumb I am by asking. And it's your job to go out and tell them. Now, the things that I give you tonight, I hope that you realize some of the things that, for instance, the sedatives, the stimulants, the tranquilizers, the hallucinogens. I hope you know the categories. I hope you know something about the physiological and the pharmacological nature of the drugs. But some things that you and I have to get across is that, first of all, I'm afraid of drugs, number one. Number two, I think drugs are good. You heard me good. You see, I have two sons, Scott and Paul. They're both born premature. Scotty was born after six and a half months in mother's uterus. He came out, he was less than two pounds. My wife's a registered nurse, I watched both deliveries. The doctor who delivered it handed Scotty to me and he fit on the end of my long finger to the back of my wrist. And when he screamed, you people couldn't have heard him scream. But they put him in an incubator with special humidity and special chemicals going through there and said, be sure that he gets mother's breast milk. And my son Scott started kindergarten. My two sons have allergy shots every single week. Without those allergy shots every single week, my two guys probably would have been dead a long time ago because of the respiratory illnesses. Right now, they're powerful, vibrant. They turn their old man on. And so I think drugs are great. The only thing I think that are bad about drugs is the misuse of drugs. And we may argue a little bit about what is misuse. The next thing I have to admit to you is that if this is the love generation, then I don't think anybody should ever, ever, ever offer anyone else a drug or a chemical. Why? Because it may be groovy for me or it may be groovy for you. But drugs act differently on every individual. And if you really love somebody, you'd never turn anybody else on. Never. The next thing I'll have to admit to you is alcohol is number one. A number one. None of the other drugs hold a candle to alcohol. Alcoholic, no, I better not say it that way. Alcohol drunken drivers kill 27,000 people a year. In two years' time, we kill more people with drunken drivers than in the eight years we've killed in Vietnam. But you don't protest this too much. One of the things that I'll admit to you is that the cigarettes and the older generation haven't set a very good style. But these are some of the things that I admit to you. Some of the approaches I give to you are for your consideration. The next thing I have to admit to you, when I started speaking six years ago, I told young people, I won't use scare tactics. I promise you I won't use scare tactics. When I was a kid and somebody told me about scare tactics, man, it turned me off. Now when I speak, I tell the people, sometimes I use extremes. I try to tell you when I'm using extremes. 
But any extreme that I use is the truth, and it could happen. And so some of these things I want you to know, because this treatment program that is good for me might be terrible for you. One avenue of success in your not letting anybody start this might be good with this person and very bad with me. If you're developing criteria and curriculum, make it flexible. All right, I'm going to give a presentation to you and uh, preach my little sermon to you. I hope I'm not talking at you. I hope that you're thinking about it so that when the question and answer time develops, that you will question, that you will wonder. One of the other things that maybe we should get straight is I think that if you're fighting marijuana, if you pick this as your number one target, you're on the weakest ground you can be on. You see, we're fighting a very good war, but grass is a pretty poor front. We don't have much information on it. Now let's put a few things straight. Let's put people into two or three categories. The experimenter, the user, and the abuser. Pretty important to categorize these people. Is there more than two or three people in this whole room who haven't tried alcohol? These are types of experimentations to find out what it's like. Let's be sure that we realize there are two kinds of addiction, physical addiction and psychological addiction. Let's realize that when I talk about THC, it's tetrahydrocannabinol. Minnesota green is about 1% or less than 1%. Then Acapulco gold, Vietnamese black, and so on. It ranges up further. And this is the active ingredient, or one of them, but the major one, in grass. Minnesota green, you cannot hallucinate with Minnesota green unless you smoke it and smoke it and smoke five, six joints pretty rapidly. What can grass do to you? I hope you realize that it can make you hallucinate if you get enough THC. It can stimulate you to the point of over-restlessness. It can be, and its strongest property is a sedative property. That's a pretty wild drug, a stimulant, a hallucinogen, and a sedative, all in one. So these are some things that maybe we should realize, and let's see if we can get some other things. I think as a teacher or someone who's interested in drugs, the first place you have to go is you. What's your attitude? And then look at society and say, what's society's attitude? I've been to pill parties where junior high school kids have asked me to come. Who are some of the biggest pushers? You know something, moms and dads in the audiences, you know where most of the junior high kids got their pills? From your medicine cabinet. From your medicine cabinet. Kids come in to me and say, gee, the adults have got the legal drugs and we got the illegal ones. And the only thing I can say to them is, do you really want their legal drugs? I don't have much defense against something along this line. LSD, DMT, many of these things can be made in a factory, many of these things can be done in a lab. Nature has always produced such things as peyote, it comes from, of course from the cactus plant, your mushroom plant has your psilocybin, morning glory seed, gymsum wheat, nutmeg and mace can give people highs. Most people won't take it because it makes them terribly sick, but it can. Man has always looked for a high. The American Indian has used peyote in their church service for I don't know how long. It's recorded many, many, many years. Man will always search high. Some of the things that you want to put in a curriculum and that you want young people to understand. Why do you want them to understand these things? Because it may help them with an understanding of self. An understanding of self. LSD, DMT, DET, these hallucinogens have no legal use except for research, and in some places it's even cut off here. You people out there realize that one drop of pure LSD can have 500 average doses. An average dose is measured in micrograms. How many of you in this college audience have ever measured a microgram? And you say to me, I get my stuff from my best friend. He won't give me 
An average dose is 250 mics, 500 mics, 750 mics. How do they know they gave you that much? One of the LSD parties I was invited to, the first thing you had to do was dose 25 sugar cubes before you could even go in. When I walked in, the kid says, oh, hi, how are you? Uh, uh, so see which one was I on? He wasn't sure. Last year, just about this time, when LSD was quite scarce, or was it the year before? When it was quite, quite scarce in the St. Paul area, some of the pushers who needed the bread took battery acid out of the cars and put it on tin foil, let it dry. It looks like the crystals of LSD. They sold it. Young people took it home, diluted it, put it into syringes, and shot it into their veins. We had a killing last year, I think it was last year, because a very best friend sold them this kind of stuff. Drugs, who are the friends? STP, you'll have an argument on this, but it's probably the strongest hallucinogen. You don't hear much about, no, it isn't Andy Granatelli's STP. It is probably the strongest hallucinogen. The reason it's not used very much is in quite a few people it has a side effect which is much like atropine poisoning. If we had the time, and if you're developing units that you're going to teach to young people, be sure you go over the history. Why? Because it'll turn them on. Well, history will turn them on? You betcha. In the Harrison Act of 1914, how come? How come marijuana was put as a narcotic? Is it a narcotic? No, it is not a narcotic. Did you know that, well, let's just take the Civil War. The Civil War, we had terrible morphine addiction, terrible. What did we use to cure morphine addiction? What did we use? Heroin. We used heroin to cure morphine addiction. In World War II, our hemp fields were being bombed and were being taken over, and we were going to be without very important rope products and fiber products. What did the federal government ask the farmers of Minnesota to grow? Hemp. What is hemp? Marijuana. We had acres and acres and acres of it being grown that the government asked that we grow. Isn't history a little bit of fun? I think so. What do I see as the most dangerous? These are your dangerous drugs. These are your four categories. I see amphetamines. I do not see grass as being a danger. Not the kind of danger that these things can be. But let me point out to you that our junior high school kids, and maybe I should put down volatile chemicals. What are volatile chemicals? Gasoline. We had a fourth grader in the city of St. Paul who sniffed gas and sniffed gas and sniffed gas until he knocked himself out, and his brain is not the same. And this is no scare tactic. The molecules from gasoline going straight up through the nose and into the brain will literally destroy brain cells. We just caught about four young sixth graders smoking grass. You say, what's the earliest time to start? You better start teaching respect for drugs at the kindergarten level. I think it's rather important. Amphetamines. What about amphetamines? Last year, pharmaceutical houses, you say, say to me, who's the pusher? Is he a pusher? Is your best friend a pusher? I suppose, if he gives you stuff. I say places like Upjohn Company, who helped to produce 9 billion amphetamines last year. Did you know that 4.5 billion of them got lost? Lost. They sent some of these amphetamines to blank names in Mexico, and they came right back to be shared right outside this door. That's more than 100 for every person in this room and through the whole United States. These people who are in control of pharmaceutical houses, I think sometimes have the scruples of Genghis Khan. I like to show this one because I don't know how many people have always said that this drug, grass, leads to heavier stuff. This is not true. And I want you to understand the statistics you see in front of you because statistics, you can make them do almost anything. Of all the people who use or experiment with grass, 95% of them in all the studies that I have seen do not go on to H or smack. What's smack? People, what's smack? 
heroin, or the hard stuff. Let's take a look at the other side. Those people who are heroin addicts, 90% did start on grass. This means that 5% went on to the heavier stuff. Out of that 5%, 90% of them became heroin addicts. You say 5%, that isn't very much. 5% of 100 isn't very many. 5% of 8 million, is that very many? 5% of 18 million, is that very many? You see, they're pretty sure that it's somewhere in this bracket of people experimenting with grass, and I think it's much higher. We got 204 million people in the United States. 5% of a huge number is a huge number. And this is one of the reasons why I think experimentation is one of the things that we'll have to live with but the, one of the reasons why I'm here to try to convince people not to experiment. We'll talk about that a little later. 75% of those people who shoot speed or mainline speed do go on to heroin too. Whose thing? Some of the kids tell me it's the in thing. It's a teenager's way of doing things. It's our generation. You adults just don't understand it. How many of you realize, for instance, you can buy a kilo of grass? I hope you people, oh boy, let me tell you something. Up in the northern part of Minnesota, the State Department got together with some administrators, and they gave them a three-day three -day workshop to help them understand drugs. After the three days were over, an administrator got up before the podium and he says, kids in my district, we don't have any kind of trouble with things like this. The thing that we have the biggest problem with is that our kids go from grass to pot to marijuana. <laughs> I just wanted to say that because somebody just put their head down and wasn't listening and I want to get their attention again. Now, whose thing is it? It's the adult's thing in most of the cases. A kilo, of course, is 2.2 pounds. Let's take grass. You can buy that in Mexico for about $3 from a farmer. You bring it right here to St. Paul, it's about $325. How many of you would like to give me $3 now? In a week from now, I'll give you three and a quarter. That's 300 and a quarter. You see why a lot of people are doing this, why a lot of adults are doing this. So I try to convince. The Costa Nostra handles a large majority of the heroin, the mafia. It's a nice organization that we support. I bring this particular slide or this particular thing up many times. Why? Because I happen to like the way the guy's dressed. I happen to like his long hair and the love beads. Do I really like it? No. But this is that way our society happens to be. And I point this out to parents. I point it out to teachers. And the majority of you in here look pretty straight. This is something I want you to know and remember. Almost 90 percent, I'd go higher than that, of the people that I helped to arrest when I was working four or five years ago and up to the present day of the big dealers that I know are people who look straight, who are Ivy Leaguers. Teachers and society, when they look at a fellow with long hair and a hippie costume on, there's a person who uses drugs. And they push and push and push, and the kid, the young adult, finally says, man, if I'm supposed to use drugs, I might as well. And we push them right into it. I personally encourage kids, if you want to rebel, grow some long hair and put some beads on it really makes some of the adults, Ugh. that's, man, you can really get them if you do that. As a matter of fact, you'll even get me a little bit. But I says, that doesn't make you any less a man or any less a woman. And you can rebel this way, and I encourage young people to do it, and not through chemicals. And this is something that I try to encourage, and so it's one of the reasons I use this. If you're presenting a curriculum, if you're trying to do something, here's my goal, to turn people on to life, not a chemical turn them on to life. And the way in which you turn them on is going to be different for different people. Why do I say this? Because, man, I can be turned on to life. I know it works. It's the easiest thing in the world, and every time you put a chemical in your body, you are artificial. 
Will it make you feel high? Will it make you feel good? Yes, it will. It'll make you feel great. But it's an artificial you. I can get very high. My two sons, Scott and Paul. Scotty is five and a half, and Paul was just four on Friday. I took him to the Y about a week ago. When I got to the Y, my boys had been taking swimming lessons, and they got in the water, and I went out to the middle of the pool, and they both pushed away, and they swam to their dad. And I got high. Man, did I get high. I was so proud of my kids, I could hardly stand it. That was an upper. Yet this Sunday, we were sitting in chairs just like this in my church. We stood up for part of the liturgy, and my oldest son, Scott, had his foot underneath the rung. And he fell forward into the chair in front of him, and he put all four of these bottom teeth right straight through his bottom lip. I had to take his lip off of his teeth. And by the time I got out in the hallway, my hand was so full of blood, and man, was I on a downer. Life is uppers and downers, but life can be the greatest thing in the world. I may sound very corny to you. For instance, I could be a tennis professional year-round, earn four to 5000 more dollars. I happen to be happy. I like teaching. I like talking. I like being with people. I like relating to them. And this is my key to life. Do not do it through a chemical. It's not worth it. When I talk to young people about why they shouldn't use grass, I admit to them, I know many people who are now working on PhDs who are very good, who've used grass for a long time. They're still very brilliant people. I also know some that are down at the very bottom, who've gone all the way, the whole route. But I say to you, it's a psychic pain. As we grow and mature, we have obstacles in our way. We have to learn how to go around it, over it, under it, or through it. But if we keep taking a chemical to delay this responsibility, we lose some of our maturity. We cannot stand this psychic pain. Everybody in this room, including many of the doctors, teachers, parents, would like to find drugs or, let's put it specifically, marijuana, something physical. Oh man, if the esophagus would only dry up and flip out of their mouths when they smoked it. That'd stop people. We look, we look all the time for something physical. But the damage that is done with every person that I have seen, it's the psychological the behavior patterns, the way in which they respond to other individuals. I would ask you to turn on to life, not a chemical. If anybody tells you that facts are in about drugs, they're crazy. Thorazine, which has been used for a long time as a major tranquilizer in state hospitals. I worked at the Hastings State Hospital for four months on the receiving unit. This has not been researched. How many of you in this room have heard that LSD causes deformed babies? How many in this room have heard that? The answer to that is it's false. If you were to take a large portion of LSD and a large portion of caffeine, where does caffeine come from, people? Coffee. You will break chromosomes equally. Break them equally. But you have to have such a fantastic large quantity of it, nobody would ever take that much. Now, the one thing I will point out to you, there's a baby born every four and a half seconds. After so many minutes, there are so many deformed children. After so many days, there's this number of deformed children. Parents who use LSD, if you keep a record of the mother or the father, or both of them use it pretty regularly, and they have children, a certain number of them are deformed. If you compare this number with this number, the LSD ba babies are a few more of them, not very many. But I'm going to say this to you. Is it worth it? We cannot measure chromosomal damage except in breakage. We don't know how much it scars, how much it slows down processes of chromosomes. When I was at Bellevue Hospital, in New York City, and I wanted to see pictures of babies who were deformed with LSD parents. And I came back and I told some of my kids who were using it, some of my friends, I said, when your child is born, or if it's born, when you become a parent, 
if your child is deformed and you've used grass and you've used, in particular, LSD, and it's deformed, will your mind ever let you rest? Ever, 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 ever. And here comes an extreme, but a very true one. I happen to look at a picture of a, it'll never leave my mind. This baby was born to a mother and father who abused LSD. And this child lived for about 18 hours, and it had an extra arm coming out of the center of its chest. And I saw a picture of this. Did LSD cause this? You cannot prove it. But do you think the minds of the mother and father will ever wonder? What do you think it'll do to them? What would it do to you? Is your kicks, is your freedom so valuable to you that you're willing to hurt other people, your own son or your own daughter, or even possibly hurt them? If anybody tried to hurt my sons, I'd step in front of them and let them kill me or I'd kill them. Sounds big and wonderful, doesn't it? But it's the way I feel. But yet I have young people who come to me and say, I'll use it because it's my thing. It's what I want to do. And I say, won't you think about your own children? And maybe this is a thought. And it's one that I would say should be presented to young people. If they want to refuse it, if they want to say that's a scare tactic, if they want to say, look, man, I don't believe it, that's their choice. That's their choice. Marijuana has been around for 2,000 years, right? It's been researched for how long? Three years. Three years. Why? Because the THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, was not synthesized until 1967. I had some kids who came in to me with big joy and says, Man, did you know I bought some THC? And I says, When did you buy it? And he says, Oh, yesterday. I says, It's probably no good by this time. You see, THC is very unstable. The longer you let the grass lay around, the weaker it gets because it is very unstable product. And I kind of hurt them a great deal when they hadn't smoked it in time. Some people are just plain anti-establishment. I'll tell you this, I was anti-establishment when I was growing up. I thought a lot of people had made some pretty stupid mistakes. I hope all of you are anti-establishment because I don't care to live in the world the way it is. I'd like it changed. There's an awful lot of good things I do like, I'm very proud of. And I think it's good to be anti-establishment. You know something? If the adults had never made a mistake, that would have meant they never tried anything. Because the only person who never makes a mistake doesn't do anything. And because we happen to be human beings, you're going to make mistakes trying to do things. And the more things you try, the more mistakes you'll make. And you'll be criticized for them. And we adults have been cr criticized by, well, what I used to be, a younger generation. My little sister tells me I'm over the hill, so I guess I better follow through. I don't feel that way, but I guess you never do. My grandfather tells me he doesn't feel over the hill either. So, Some people, why do they use them? Because they're curious. Gee, man, I don't want to skip out. I don't want to do any of these things. I'm just curious. I'd like to know how it feels. I can stand up here in front of you very easily and say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. I don't like coffee. I don't like alcohol. I don't smoke. Am I a goody-goody? Oh, no. It was my choice, just like what you're all talking about. Anything I say, anything Bob said last night, or any of the speakers you'll ever have can tell you all kinds of things. But you can do as you cotton pick and well please. But I think that it's our job in education and our job in the schools to tell you some of the things we've learned so that you'll have a better way of making your own choices. This is kind of important to me. Here's something that I think is kind of important. Results of substance use vary. Let's take an example. Let's take strawberry acid. I suppose I could talk about electric window pane or uh, white window pane or electric water. Uh, what are some of those names? You people might know some of them. When the kids come in and talk to me, I say, gee, uh, what are you talking about? Because I don't have any idea many times until they finally tell me. They come in and try to give me all these fancy names, and I finally say, gee, I don't know. What are you talking about? You see, you'll never know everything. All right, what is strawberry acid? Strawberry acid happens to be one-third LSD, one-third speed, and one-third strychnine. All right? Amount used, 250 mics, an average dose. Size and condition of the user, I'm six foot three. Well, I guess I'm more than 210. 
Length of time, this will be my first time. Combinations of substances, I just took some speed before this. Motives and feelings of the user to get stoned. You young people are maybe getting over some of that, but let me just tell you this. I had lunch with a Peruvian boy about two weeks ago, and he says, let's go have a drink. And I kind of looked at him because he was only a sophomore in high school. And so I, we went into a place, and, and uh, he ordered a beer, and I let him get it. And I told him I didn't care for any alcohol. I didn't like it. And he says, you know something? You Americans are extremely strange. And he says, I went with a bunch of guys who said, let's go have a party and have some drinks. And I thought they'd meant we'd go have a, a drink and talk and, and dance and have fun. But he says, we got there and they all got stoned. And he says, you know something? You're one of the few countries I've ever visited whose main objective is every time you get something that will intoxify you, <laughs> intoxicate you, I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, you'll have to excuse me, that you go ahead and do this. And so immediately I wondered about this and I began to look and I began to wonder about our own system. My own brother went all the way through high school from his freshman year on and every weekend he got stoned once or twice a weekend. When he reached 21, I don't think he's had more than one drink a month for the rest of his life. What's the thrill? It was illegal before. Maybe that's part of our problem. I hope not. Nature of social situation, experimenters and users like to do it at a party. Abusers, you find doing it alone quite often. What's the real reason that I think people want to use drugs and is to have their feelings changed? Some of you could say, oh, brother, you're yawning right now. Man, I wish I could go to sleep. Or some of you are saying, I'd like to change my headache, or I'd like to do this, or I'd like to do that. And what's the first thing you think about when you've got a headache? Take an Excedrin. What's the next thing you think about? If one didn't work, take two. We have the most chemically orientated society I think we could possibly have. We would like to change our feelings. What are some of the, in, some of the motives for use? It's the in thing. I want to feel different. I'm curious, forget, sad, frustrated. I want the change to be pleasant. I don't know how many adults just really don't realize this, that taking drugs in almost all situations is a fantastically fun experience. Otherwise, why do they do it? What is some of the motives for continued use? They do feel different, and the feelings is great. Let's just take heroin for a big example. A heroin user, when he puts the needle in his arm and he shoots, he gets a fantastic rush. He gets a warm feeling. Sexual intercourse is followed in males in particular by an orgasm. This is the same feeling that a user of heroin gets from the needle and the heroin. So pretty soon he does not look for female companionship. If he has a wife, he could care less about her. He begins to get psychological problems because he begins to wonder, am I, am I a man? You see, there's an awful lot of feelings that are involved. I happen to have at least four young people who've shown it to me, and I've seen it, where they took the needle and put it underneath their toenail, and they took a needle and put it under their tongue because they didn't want their parents to see the track marks. Do you think it feels good? It must or they wouldn't do such things. So these are some things maybe we should realize. I've been talking to you a little bit about the general problem, some of the things that I think you should know. Maybe you've heard them all before. Maybe I'm talking some of the things that you could go to a book and find out. What are some of the controls? What are some of the ways in which we can stop some of this? What are some of the reasons and some of the factors that we have to work on? You as an individual, you as a teacher, you who work with young people, and the first one happens to be social. The peer group pressure is your single best, your very best. As I work with a young person who's strung out, I try to find their friends because their friends can influence them. But what I usually find is friends who are strung out. This is a very, very big key, a very big factor. Who are the people that they go with? Your family is an extremely important element. How many of you were raised where you had a before-dinner drink, an after-dinner drink, or one or both? 
How many of you, when you got done working with your dad in the yard or your mother in the kitchen, you'd sit down and have a glass of wine or a can of beer? Some people say, oh my goodness, we'd never do that in our home. But other people, yeah, we, we did that in our home. My mother smokes like a steam engine. My stepfather was an alcoholic. I know many of the problems and many of the things that are faced by a young person in a home situation. And these things have a fantastic influence, positive, negative. We talked a little bit about the history before, and one of the things you should never forget is the legal control. We used to fight drugs, we still do, legally. For some people it's a very, very good method. For some people it's a very, very poor method. If somebody in this room, and I'm sure that there is somebody in this room who uses grass, you go out that door and some federal agents, some narcs, pick you up and you're of possession of grass, right now is it a felony or is it a misdemeanor? What is it, people? See, most of you said felony and that's not true. It's a misdemeanor. It used to be a felony. But three weeks ago, President Nixon signed into law that made the change. If the Minneapolis fuzz picks you up, it's still a felony because the state law has not been changed. I know police in St. Paul who quickly call a narc and say, we know of someone, we want to bring them in, would you come make the arrest? Because if we make it, it has to be a felony. The laws are fantastically interesting. They're not all bad. They do need some changes, some more strict, some more lenient. It was kind of a ridiculous law to have LSD as a misdemeanor and grass as a felony. These things are slowly, very slowly, being changed. I hope I don't turn too many people off. Religious control. For some people, this is fantastically important. I happen to believe in God very, very much. I've had too many miracles happen to me personally and seen a great many more. I happen to think this way very much. Some of the churches are not saying a thing. Some are. God gave us a body. He called it a temple. To some people, this is a very important factor, and you should not forget it because it is part of a control. I was talking to you a little bit about attitude before. I was, I guess must be three years now, I was down in North Carolina. I was with a fellowship of Christian athletes, and Paul Dietzel was leading us. He's a pretty good football coach. We were running up and down a football field, and I was kind of huffing and puffing. I was in pretty good shape then, too. And he said, come on in, gentlemen. We came in. We sat in a big semicircle. As we sat in that semicircle, we had our heads down. We were puffing away. We weren't going to pay any attention to that clown up there. We were pooped. Finally, he said, gentlemen, we all have thoughts about sex. Yes, 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 yes. And he said, you know, sex is a lot like soil. We said, like what? And he said, like soil. We says, man, you've got to be out of your tree. He says, no, you can plant a rose bush and a tomato plant in that soil. Before too long, you have something very beautiful and something very good to eat. But he said, if you happen to get some of that soil on your feet, and you walk across your mother's carpet, it becomes dirt. And you see, it's your attitude. You see, you don't need a curriculum. You don't need any materials like you saw here, or like you've been picking up. What you need to do is understand yourself and understand the problem. And that's very difficult. But that's the first step, is your attitude. What do I think is the what do I think is the key to the whole thing? And that's your self-concept. Are you a good person? Are you worth something? Do you belong? Do you have faith in you? You see, the self-concept of an individual can be destroyed in many ways. It can be destroyed by you as students. You know why some adults rebel to you students? because you hurt the adult so bad. And you say, yeah, but they hurt us too. And is that any excuse? And that's just what I say to the adults too. And I begin to wonder a little bit about the self-concept, and I wonder how I'm building it in my sons. 
You see my little guy, Paul, who was just four Friday, the opening day of pheasant season, his dad, me, I hope, we waltzed through the cornfields. <laughs> we waltzed through the cornfields. And this little guy was trudging along the fields. And he had his toy pistol with him. And a couple of sparrows flew up. He said, there goes a hummingbird, Dad. He said, no, son, that was a sparrow. We don't shoot hummingbirds, do we, Dad? I said, that was a sparrow, son. It was a hummingbird, Dad. I said, okay. And all of a sudden, up flies a pheasant. I hollered, hen! And I put my gun back down. He says, that was a mama pheasant, wasn't it, Daddy? I said, yep. We don't shoot mamas, do we, Dad? Nope. We, it's okay to shoot dads, isn't it? <laughs> I began to wonder what kind of self-concept I was building in this young man. We got back to our home, and we went into our home and took off all our stuff, and this young man had been walking for almost four hours with his dad. And I wasn't about to pick him up. He had to walk, because how could I shoot with him, you know, holding him in my arms? We got back into my home, and he said to me, he says, Daddy, I've got a headache. Can I have an aspirin? And I looked down at him, and I says, Paul, can, can we wait a little while? And he said, Daddy, you don't want me to have one unless I really need it, do you? And I was pretty proud that he understood that you don't take something into your system unless you really need it. Because we solve too many of our problems chemically. Can't you turn on to life? Can't you get rid of a headache by getting away from the tension? by walking around the block, by getting away from the idiot box, a uh, television set. Take the strain off your eyes. Aren't there many ways of doing different things so you don't have to use a chemical? I think it all goes back. I told you I lived with an alcoholic stepfather. I lived in a welfare home. I've done an awful lot of things that are obstacles, but yet I had a lot of people who helped me. And I hope that I've built a self-concept that says I'm good. I'm proud of who I am, and I'll make lots of mistakes. But this is what we want to build into our young people. I have one more, and then I'll stop and let you uh, throw a couple of questions at me. And then I guess we'll go on to uh, Tina, who will talk to you, I think, about Youth Challenge. Uh, be pretty good, I hope. I'm quite confident. But look up at this one right up here. The total effect of drug use, there's three major things. Yes, there are other things, but three major things. One is an individual's personality. One is the pharmacological nature of the drug. And the other is the social environment. But even knowing all these things, the drug is still unpredictable. Now, what do I mean, for instance? Let's just delve a little bit into an individual's personality. Let's take a study that was done at Stanford. Let's divide you up into group number one, group number two, and the people sitting along the walls and standing over there, you're group number three. Now, you're in separate rooms. You don't hear any of these things. This is what actually happened. This group over here, I'm going to give you a small dose of LSD, and I want you to tell me how you feel. This group right here, I'm going to give you a small dose of LSD, and I want you to tell me how you feel. That group along the wall back there, I want, I'm going to give you some cough syrup, it's a very special new cough syrup. We want you to tell me if there's any side effects. What do they really do? This group, they've told you they're going to give you a small dose of LSD. What do they really give you? A placebo. What's a placebo? It's a nothing, right? It's like a pill that has sugar in it, or it's like a pill that has salt in it. It's a nothing. Did you know that 90% of you hallucinate? 90%. 90%. This group over here, I said I was going to give you a small dose of LSD. They really do. 70% of these people hallucinate over here. The group back there, I said I was going to give some cough syrup. What do I really give them? The same small dose of LSD that you got. 20% of them, a little less than 20%, hallucinate. The rest of them get stomach cramps, neck aches, back aches, headaches. Terrible feelings. <laughs> it's what you perceive. What do you want to happen to you? You can hand a person a pill and tell them it's LSD and they've read enough about it to know they're supposed to hallucinate. 
They want to hallucinate. I'd like to know how it feels. 90% of them hallucinate. It's kind of wild. How many of you during your career so far have gone to parties? Some lady or girl or somebody will take a can of 3-2 beer and drink it down and get completely stoned. That's impossible. Why did she get, or he get, but it's usually a she. Why did she get completely stoned? Because she wanted to. She wanted to. I can still remember going to parties because I didn't like alcohol. And I'd take the drink and I'd put some alcohol behind my ears and a little, I'd take one sip and spit it out. And then I could walk around and I had more fun than anybody else. <laughs> I could walk across the street right now and start down your street and whoopee, how are everything going? And holler and whoop de doo and the police would stop me and they'd say, he must be drunk. And if they could find alcohol on me, I'd go into the pokey for a while. If they couldn't find alcohol on me, they were sure I was taking drugs. They'd check me out, and gee, I'm not on drugs. So where would they put me? Where I worked for a while, at the Hastings State Hospital. So why, then, why do, does this happen? People like to act goofy. They want to whoop de doo They want to be crazy. And as soon as they put a chemical into their body, drugs, alcohol, whatever you want, they can act crazy, and society says, ah, it's all right, the kid's just having fun. I can remember kids telling me, gee, I, I keep a bottle uh, uh, near the front door, and when I get stoned on grass, I get ready to go in the house, and I take one swig of alcohol, and I walk in, and if my dad or mom catch me going upstairs, they come over and they sniff my breath, and they think, ah, he's just been out parting it up. I can remember when I did that. It's all right. But if the kid came in and says, Look, Dad, I'm stoned from grass. You what? He'd be terrified. But alcohol, I can remember it. You see, it's a societal type thing. It's our own self-concept, our own image of who we are. It's kind of important. I have one that I usually talk a long time on, and that's on freedoms. And I'm not going to spend any more time, because I guess I've used up quite a bit already. But I think it's quite important that when you work with people, you cover many aspects of it. I don't think that in education you should be so afraid. You see, you're very idealistic. I met some young men who were standing in the hall, and they just started their student teaching. And I said, young man, you're going to learn more in the next two or three weeks than you've learned in all three years here. And he said, man, in one day I learned that much. <laughs> and you see... It's the practical experience. And one of the things I'm going to tell you is that we try to be objective. I can't give you my values. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't want them. But the thing that I will do is that I have to be me. If I see somebody drop something, I usually go over and pick it up because I respect their property. I usually tell them how I feel, but say, look, this is me saying it. There are other sides to the picture. But I'm never afraid to say, look, here's the way I think you should go. But you're going to have to make up your own mind. You see, for the last five to ten years, teachers have gone out and tried to be so objective that they have become cold. And I think that's part of our problem. I think parents and teachers and other people are trying to leave you alone so much to make up your own minds that you're confused about whether we care. And we do. I had a fantastic button on last night. It says, give a damn. I'm a little more conservative tonight. I have on my pin up here, it says, I'll smoke pot when the Pope takes the pill. <laughs> Sorry about that, sister. Well, I think the one I had on the night before that said, uh, get really stoned, drink wet cement. And the one I had on the day before that said, stage a real sit-in, drink x lax <laughs> You see, if you, lose some of your, if you lose some of your fun, you see, this is something that I talk about being a Christian. You can have fun being a Christian. You can have fun being straight. I've got kids who come in and say, man, I cannot have any fun unless I've got some grass or unless I've got some alcohol. 
And you know what's happened? You don't know how to relate to people. You don't know how to turn on to somebody. You don't know how to turn on to life, and you have to become artificial. You know how groovy and great it is to be straight and to be high? If you do, it's the greatest feeling in the whole world. I know because I can do it. And life, if you expect it to be a bunch of uppers all the time, and every time it starts to go to a downer, you turn to a chemical, then you're missing part of life too. And so I'll close my formal part of the presentation, and I'll be available for questions later. But I'm going to close with this statement. I remember you guys and dolls sitting in front of me. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Thank you very much for letting me speak to you.